Off the top of your head, can you name a famous Mexican dinosaur? Mexico is chronically left out of paleontological discourse. This is a shame, for a new horned dinosaur from Mexico has something new to tell us about the evolution of these crested creatures, even with its shattered remains. As it stands, Mexican paleontology has many fundamental challenges. Each step of the scientific process, from finding a dinosaur bone stuffed outcrop, all the way to getting a new find into an exhibit, is fraught with problems. Firstly, there are three main paleontological institutes, two of which are in the same city. They don't receive a lot of money and are forced to budget every little thing, which restricts progress. Secondly, similar to U.S. property rights, landowners own the fossils on their land. Savvy landowners sell off their fossils, restrict paleontologists from excavating on their land, or incorrectly collect the fossils for themselves. While some don't care at all about the fossils, from a lack of education on their significance. Furthermore, Mexican institutions are in an insulated bubble. Many scientists don't speak English so a lot of research and media opportunities are out the window. Mexico is in the top five countries in the world when it comes to dinosaur fossils. They're everywhere. But no one outside Mexico knows about it to any great degree. I'm currently working with a paleo artist and museum volunteer, Daniel Barrera Guevara, to shed light upon not only the human side of Mexican paleontology, but of the fossils themselves. Hopefully this sparks more interest for us northerners. During dig seasons between the years of 2007 and 2011, paleontologists found bits and pieces of an unusual dinosaur, excavated from a layer of eroding rock near the town of La Salada and Ocampo in Coahuila state. The team of paleontologists, led by Hector Rivera Silva from the Museo del Desierto or the Museum of the Desert in Sotillo, Coahuila were nearing the end of their field expedition in 2007. They arrived at La Salada locality and immediately found lots of fossils. They were mostly fragmentary bones and pieces chewed up from the fossilization process and the process of erosion. A large assortment of tattered hadrosaur bones were what they immediately came across. Big femurs, humeri, and vertebrae. Not interesting enough to excavate and take back to the museum, but something more compelling lay among these fragments. Some distinctly non-hadrosaur bones were in the wreckage. They turned out to be parts from a ceratopsian, one of the horned dinosaurs. This find was important, as the blasted chip bits they found held tantalizing clues of a new type of ceratopsian, so far unknown from Mexico, a big-nosed centrosaurine. A scapula and femur were the most recognizable bones which caught the discoverer's eyes. Though smashed to Dorito dust, the majority of the bone was still in place and could be put back together in the lab, if they could excavate them. With time wasting away, Hector Rivera Silva and colleagues set up the dig site which would last for four more years. Though they weren't entirely sure of the type of bone they had found, they knew it belonged to a horned dinosaur. Once they collected the fragments, the team pieced it back together, jigsaw style. Eventually, it started to resemble a scapula or shoulder blade. It would take an entire decade for these remains to see the limelight. It took so damn long because the material was shattered. Imagine putting a 10,000 piece puzzle back together, but all the pieces look almost identical, and you're missing half of them only to find out the puzzle you're working on is just one piece of a way bigger puzzle. And you're still missing like 80% of the entire puzzle. When everything was fit back together in the lab, and some putty was fit into the cracks to stabilize the bones, and visualize the lost pieces, the find totaled a scapula, femur, a chunk of lower leg, a splint of the ilium, parts of the frill, lower jaw, and a section of snout. Museo del Desierto crew had a deal to publish the name of this new dinosaur in an issue of National Geographic Mexico. Since they had to wait for the magazine to release the name, 
Their paper was released earlier, referring to the new dinosaur as Dinosaur X. Straight out of some low-budget sci-fi schlock, right? Thankfully, one of the pieces, called a squamosal from the frill, holds some characteristics which set it aside not only from other close relatives, but to all other horned dinosaurs, opening the floodgates on naming the creature as something completely new. It was named Yauikauceratops, Mudai, in 2017. Yauikau is a word from the Nahuatl language meaning ancient in English. Its name fully translates to ancient horned face, which ironically is also the translation of the even older Archaeoceratops from China. The frill and snout bits told the discoverers what they were working with was a Centrosaurine Ceratopsian. The horned dinosaurs are roughly split into two big groups, the Chasmosaurs and the Centrosaurs. The Chasmosaurs adapted their large frills for display, with huge twin gaping holes in the center to save weight. These horned dinosaurs included the likes of Pentaceratops and Triceratops. Centrosaurs, on the other hand, emphasized their horns over their frills. Some, like Aeneosaurus, carried bent nose horns, while others, like Styracosaurus, displayed a rosette of straight spikes along the frill. Upon description of Yauikauceratops, only a few of its close relatives were known to science. Nasutoceratops, a bovine-horned, big-nose form from Utah, and Avaceratops, a small-bodied, short-horned form from Montana. It was this part of the frill, called the squamosal bone, which tipped off the describers that Yauikauceratops was a close relative to Nasutoceratops. A few years after Yauikauceratops' description, more Nasutoceratops relatives were found. The even more fragmentary Crichton Ceratops and three currently undescribed species from Mexico and the U.S. Together, they now form a group called Nasutoceratopsini. This tribe is characterized by big, beefy snoots, small head shields, weird brown horns, and no nasal horns. They were the first group to branch off the Centrosaur family tree and so far are known up to the Campanian stage of the late Cretaceous Epoch, roughly 80 to 75 million years ago. No one is sure if they made it to the KT extinction, but I have a sneaking suspicion they did, and were more diverse across North America. The individual Yaoi Cauceratops found near La Salada is estimated to be pretty shrimpy. These chums were around 3 meters, or 9.8 feet long. It likely wouldn't have been tall enough to look you in the eye, with a shoulder height around 1 to 1.5 1 meters, or 3 to 4 feet. At this size, it's estimated to have weighed around 1 to 2 tons. Due to its small size, this individual was first considered a juvenile. To test this hypothesis, Museo del Desierto crew examined the single backbone they'd found. Since the bone preserved signs telling them it was completely fused together as a single bone, it must have belonged to a subadult or adult animal. Yauikauceratops was truly just a shorty. Even though most of the body was not found, horned dinosaurs didn't differ much in the shape of their bodies. Wide chunky torsos, short limbs, wide feet, broad hips, and a short tail are all hallmarks of the non-head parts. Of course, there could always be exceptions. The head has been reconstructed with a deep, blunt snout, like Nasutoceratops, with short brow horns and wide triangular bits of bone lining the short frill. I think the pieces they have are just a little too fragmentary to accurately estimate what the whole skull looked like. Much of the frill can be assumed due to the law of symmetry, and the lower jaw usually stays the same shape between species, but I don't know. I understand this is one of the most complete Mexican Ceratopsians found in quite some time, and is also their first centrosaur, so mocking up a skeleton for display to help create Earth Science outreach kind of outweighs just how fabricated the exhibit should be. The piece of frill preserves three bumps which would have been covered in keratin when the animal was alive. The piece higher up also has a bump. Together they may have acted as the base for longer curved keratin covers. The snout bone matches those of Nasutoceratops and Avaceratops enough to reconstruct the snout as deep but thin from side to side. Extremely well-known paleoartist Louis V. Ray has reconstructed the snout housing an immense volume of nasal passages and soft tissues, 
This inflated nasal passageway is a common hypothesis of these Nasutoceratops type centrosaurs. They may have served an air warming function. More and more, it is becoming rather clear North America saw a biological explosion of Ceratopsians during the late Cretaceous. This is not out of the blue, and fits a general trend among other dinosaurs at the time. From Alaska to Mexico, from 80 to 70 million years ago, horned dinosaurs, tyrannosaurs, hadrosaurs, and ankylosaurs, and others, were cycling in and out with different groups occupying different regions. What's weird about this pattern is the lack of sizable geographic barriers between these populations. There weren't any mountain ranges which would block and isolate genetic pools of dinosaurs from one another. Another explanation seems more likely. Climate. North America began to see rapid climate change at around 70 million years ago. The sea level started to drop. The Western Interior Seaway began to evacuate from its place in Central North America, and temperatures cooled. It wasn't dramatic, but it was enough to eventually snuff out the Western Interior Seaway from the map. These environmental pressures resulted in distinct climatic zones throughout North America. It wasn't mountain ranges, seas, nor tectonic shifts which isolated breeding dinosaur populations to produce new species. It was the climate. Since there were different climate zones for the North and the South of North America, different plants with different climate needs lived in the two zones. Herbivores adapted to take advantage of these separate zones, and carnivores soon followed. Yaoikau Ceratops adds a new clue as to how Ceratopsians diversified along this gradient. The layer of rock from which Yaoikau Ceratops was found is called the Aguha Formation and preserves evidence of a swamp-like habitat. The sediment consists of sandstones and mudstones. These sediments were deposited as a deltaic system, with plenty of salt marshes, oxbows, and nearshore marine deposits. The particular rock the Yaoikauceratops fossil was found in was shale. For those uninitiated in the ways of the rock, allow me to shed a little light on the subject. As boring as rock is on the face of it, it's extremely important for understanding the biology of the critter bones within the rock. Shale is a rock made from squishing really small sediments together over millions of years. This means the rock used to be extremely fine particles of mud, which can consist of clay minerals, quartz, and calcite. Clay minerals are just what's left over after a mineral like, say, calcite or feldspar is weathered and eroded for a very long time. Since the particles which will go on to become shale are so small, they take a while to sink down to the bottom of a body of water. In a fast-moving body of water, they rarely settle and are pushed and bounced along until they reach a body of water which has slowed down. Uh, what do we call bodies of water which are typically slow or still? Swamps. Lakes, lagoons, river deltas, offshore, marshes, and floodplains are also the typical low-energy dead ends where these almost weightless particles can finally rest. This is the proof you would need to discern what kind of environment the critter's bones you found belonged. Once you have that information, it can help you infer why it had certain characteristics, what it may have eaten, and who may have eaten it, and so on. In today's swamps, marshes, or wetlands, there aren't a lot of large-bodied animals. There are some, of course, and the recent past was populated by many more. Moose frequent temperate swamps. Then you've also got alligators and crocodiles, tapirs in South America and Indonesia, black bears in Florida, and brown bears in other temperate swamps. Of course, there's large deer and cougars in many southern US states, the Indonesian hairy rhinos, and birds which can grow to a meter to a meter and a half. In the recent past, indigenous cultures ran into swamp-dwelling ground sloths in Florida, giant armadillos, which I'm sure could traverse the bayous, camelids, and so much more. There aren't a lot of animals specifically adapted to living in or near swamps and marshes to the degree that their entire bodies detail every little change needed to live in this environment. This is probably because most large-bodied animals you might find in a swamp don't actually live there all the time. The few which do are usually birds and reptiles that are not usually huge. The storks, 
ducks, crocodilians, frogs, lizards, snakes, and turtles. A swamp-dwelling existence for little yaoi cowceratops could work. I just don't see anything in the few bones which were found which specifically suggest such a lifestyle. The only fact is, the individual which was found lived and died in or near a swamp. This swamp-dwelling habit is also why the skeletal mount at the Museo del Desierto is reconstructed with short brow horns and small shield spikes. I wouldn't want to trudge through swamps and bayous with long thin spines and horns, which could easily get tangled. Another explanation as to its small size was presented in the first 2016 paper, which described the bones in detail, but did not name it. Yowie Cowceratops may have been small as a way to avoid competition from other Ceratopsians. This might also be why it lived in a marshy habitat. Another Ceratopsian found in the same layer of rock, but more northerly, in the state of Texas, was the Chasmosaur Aguja Ceratops. This big bruiser was around two to three times the size of Yowie Cowceratops, but was also found in shale rocks deposited in a swampy environment. I don't think something as big and heavy as a Guhaceratops would want to fight through mud, moss, and thickets all its life. Having a smaller body and smaller pointy bits would allow Yowie Cowceratops to reap the benefits of trudging through bogs and marshes for soft, easily digestible vegetation and protein sources like crustaceans and turtles it could crack with its presumably large, blunt beak. Yowie Cowceratops could go where a Guhaceratops could not follow. Yaoi Cowceratops is but one of many mysterious Ceratopsians uncovered across the dry, arid expanse of Mexican outcrops. It provides an interesting clue of what more we might find out about the Nasuda Ceratopsians. I don't know about you, but these guys are some of my favorite Ceratopsians. I bet they made some wacky ass sounds with those inflated snoots of theirs. Without a doubt, there are many more fragmentary Ceratopsians awaiting description, and far more lying in wait below the ground. Subscribe to consume some delicious contento, gore the like button, scratch out a comment, and jostle the notification bell just so you're in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Thanks goes to my supporters on Patreon. You're making this all possible. If you'd like to support the channel, and gain some perks along the way, consider joining at any tier you'd like.